We've known for a while that Wirt fancies a girl back at home. With his talk of lost love in Chapter 1, the crush he mentions at Endicott's house, and the discussion around the campfire about how he can't seem to catch a break with this girl he likes. Wirt obviously has some pretty strong romantic feelings toward this girl Sarah, so of course we were bound to come to a chapter that has its focus based on romantic love. Or Eros for my Greek audience. We know that Wirt thinks about Sarah a lot, and now at the start of this special flashback episode, we see Wirt's life before he entered the unknown. He's just recorded a tape for Sarah, sampling his poetry and clarinet to show her his inner self. That tape has got poetry and clarinet on it, Greg. Poetry and clarinet! We'll soon see that she seems pretty fond of him too. Though Wirt appears to be clueless of that fact, Wirt plays up the night in his head. As he prepares to finally open his heart to Sarah, he records the perfect tape and finds the perfect Halloween costume. Yes. Everything must be perfect. Yes. Wirt is as ready as he's going to get, and he ventures off to share his personal feelings with the girl he likes. Into the unknown. But now outside of his house and in the cold real world, the people he meets are not as careful with his emotions as he is. Greg, who just wants to hurry things along so he can go on a frog hunt tonight, grabs Wirt's specially prepared tape and hands it over to a group of Sarah's friends. They're a little sassy when they find out about Wirt's feelings, which embarrasses him quite a bit. <coughs> You want us to give it to her for you? Well, it's for a different Sarah. They lightly tease him about his costume that he, in one scene previous, was so proud of. So what are you, Wirt? Some kind of gnome? Uh, I, I don't know. Well, see, I was, I thought I'd just... Wirt also catches word that Jason Funderburker already has plans to ask Sarah out at the Halloween party tonight. Hearing that he's got competition, Wirt immediately cancels everything. His perfect plan that he labored over was just met with slight resistance, so he decided it was an abject failure. He heads home once again waxing poetic about his sorry state. Is the dove never to meet the sea for want of the odious mountain? Wirt sees Jason Funderburger as the whole package, the guy who has everything he doesn't, a real winner. But of course, we'll see he's... Hey, Sarah, are you ready to go? Wirt was so eager to get home after this bad news, he forgot all about the tape that's on its way to Sarah as they speak. Wirt assumes, since he always assumes the worst of people, that Sarah and Jason are going to listen to it and make fun of him. So he has to get that tape back. The boys show up to the Halloween party that Sarah's hanging at. Wirt is afraid to go inside since he wasn't invited, but it's unclear if that's actually true or Wirt just assumes that it's true. Maybe no one was formally invited. No one seems to be put off by his presence and some people, namely Sarah, are glad to see him show up. Sarah invites Wirt to hang out at the graveyard with some other kids, but Wirt declines the invitation, seeing that Jason Funderburger has already staked his claim. Sarah really wants Wirt to join them. She says it twice. Hey, you should come. Well, see ya, hopefully. But Wirt is so down on himself, he's actually making Sarah's night that much worse. It wouldn't be the first time his own self-doubt got in the way of other people's plans. You're a stubborn jerk. When are you going to give this up? Maybe never. Eventually, Wirt shows up at the graveyard, the Eternal Garden, with the other kids. There we see Jason Funderburger with no game at all, doing his best to impress Sarah. She's not feeling it and politely rejects him. But Wirt only sees the crowd adoring his rival and hating him. If anything, this flashback shows that Wirt doesn't really have any friends. Or at least he seems to think he has no friends. When Greg's gregariousness blows Wirt's cover, Sarah once again is real glad to see Wirt shown up. But Wirt still can't can't seem to comprehend that. At this point, the police come in and ruin the kids' Halloween fun. They all scatter. Wirt jumps up on the garden wall, just in time to see Sarah and Jason discover his embarrassing tape. That's it. That's the end. Wirt has finally crossed the threshold of beginning to connect with someone, only to see it as a definitive end. He's so emotionally naked right now and the risk of getting hurt is too great. He can't imagine being loved like he wants to be. If life is about the risks you take to connect with others, by giving up in this moment, Wirt is giving up on living his life. And with that, Wirt jumps over the garden Mall. Hey, that's the name of the show. Wirt becomes angry with Greg, blaming him for all of tonight's missteps. In his tirade, Wirt even calls out his own stepdad for trying to get him to join marching band. Clearly, the guy wants his stepson to have a healthy social life, but Wirt thinks so little of himself, he's mad when people try to help him. Greg suggests marching band could help him hang out with Sarah more, but Wirt has decided he's moved on from her now. That ship has sailed, Greg. He's just opened up to her and can already imagine her disdain toward him. At that point, Greg finds a frog in the bushes, finally satisfying his frog hunt needs and insists they give him a name. I don't want to have anything to do with you or that frog. Wirt has long expected the worst from people, only to be proven time and time again that they're not as bad as they seem. But really, the only intentional cruelness that we see in this whole show, besides the Beast and his direct agents, is from Wirt himself. Wirt has cut himself off from everyone. Friends, girlfriends, family. He's afraid of other people, and he doesn't seem to care for himself very much either. Just then, a train comes down the tracks they're standing on, causing them to leap down a steep, bumpy hill, plunging Greg, Wirt, and the newly found frog into a pond where they sink unconscious. 
There's a C.S. Lewis quote from his book The Four Loves, and though his views tend to skew very Christian for an agnostic story about pumpkin gods and zombies, his words feel applicable here. There is no safe investment. To love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung, and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The alternative to tragedy, or at least the risk of tragedy, is damnation. The only place outside heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all of the dangers and perturbances of love is hell. After giving up on love, Wirt has placed himself in his own personal hell. Wirt wakes up from his flashback dream, surrounded by Beatrice's family. Remembering his lost little brother, Wirt now knows it's time to act. He loves Greg and must save him. Concerned, Beatrice's mom tells Wirt to wait for the snowstorm to pass. But Wirt, who always needed things to be perfect, and would crumble under the slightest inconvenience, Wirt, who at the start of his journey always chose the path of inaction, even to the detriment of himself and others, he now ignores the bird's warning and instead chooses decisive action. He must act, and he must act now. You'll be no good to your brother dead. I was never any good to him alive, either. Wirt's been living his life as if he was already dead, never taking a chance on anyone. After replaying his last memories in the real world, Wirt regrets how he's treated everyone. With his new eyes, he sees that he's been hurting others by hating himself. He was cruel to Greg. He wouldn't give his stepdad a chance even though he seems to care about Wirt. He deprived Sarah of a fun night together that she instead spent with Jason Funderburger, who she's not that fond of. And then his fight with Beatrice, which ended with her saving his life. Wirt assumed everyone doesn't like him. He assumed everyone wants to laugh at him. And Wirt just wanted to retreat back into his lonely bedroom. But not anymore. Wirt has a responsibility to the world. The people that he cares about need him. And he knows you can't always wait for conditions to be perfect. So he walks off into the blizzard to meet his destiny and enter Act 3. Wirt's flashback has finally showed us all the context we need to truly understand where our main character is coming from. So when it comes to stories where the protagonist enters a strange world with kooky characters that all suddenly gets neatly explained in a flashback sequence near the end, then Mulholland Drive is, is not a really great example. But if you feel like spending some time getting confused with me, then I got a video for you. And while I got you here, let's settle something once and for all. What time period does the real world take place in? Kinda looks like somewhere between the late 70s and 90s, but back then Sarah probably would have had access to a cassette player and she doesn't here. I've heard a lot of good arguments, but I'd like to hear yours. And I'll see you next time in the final chapter. The Unknown.